Amen. So how did we get here? Moses. Moses' parents seem to be God-fearing people. They believed, you know, what they had been told orally that their forefathers, you know, going back to Abraham, that God had met with him and said, hey, leave your country. I'll show you what's up. He goes on a very, very long camping trip. Poor guy. Never got to live in anything but a tent for the rest of his life. I feel for him. Some of you think that's great. I don't, but we could talk afterwards. But he was obedient. God shows him a land, promises him a land, promises him a lot more than that. We went through all of the covenant. But to a, a specific people and to a specific land, makes the same promises to, to you know, the next concession of sons. Says that your, your descendants are going to be in Egypt for 400 years. It's not going to be pretty. It wasn't pretty. Things got pretty ugly. He started killing the babies. Toss them into the river. Moses comes. He's a beautiful baby. Mom can't bear to do it. I think there was a sense greater than just this is a pretty baby. They had a sense of destiny. They built a boat for him. A, and they put him in the river. So they're kind of obedient to the call of throwing him in the river. But they do it just upstream from where Pharaoh's daughter is, and I don't think this was any kind of coincidence, this was providence, Pharaoh's daughter is, is there bathing, they find the baby, she adopts him, but she, she gives him back to Pharaoh's mom, or uh, to Moses' mom, she, she has an opportunity to imprint upon him his destiny, she spends the next 40 years in Pharaoh's, you know, uh, uh, palaces being trained, God teaching him he's somebody. God teaching him he is indeed the rescuer, which is what Moses means, rescued. That's what the name means. That he's going to be the redeemer. Tries to do it on his own. Killing an Egyptian. Didn't work out so well. Runs off into the desert. Right? God uses a pretty cool event of rescuing seven damsels in distress to remind him he is the Redeemer indeed. He is the one God called, uh, but he's content then to live with Jethro for the next 40 years, watching after his sheep, wandering around the desert, learning he's now, in fact, nobody. So for 40 years he learns he's somebody. For 40 years he learns he's nobody. And then after this 80 years of lessons, he, he runs into a burning bush that indeed is on fire, but is not being consumed. Right? And God starts speaking to him from this bush. That's how we got here. Right? That's, that's a really quick recap of where we're at. And after God is telling Moses, I'm going to send you now. It's time. I've heard their cry. It's been 400 years. I made a covenant. I've made promises. I will keep my promises. These, this is my people. I'm going to pull them out of Egypt. I'm going to make a great nation of these people. It's time. Moses doesn't want to go. <laughs> For whatever reason, and we've talked about that, probably a lot of reasons, probably many reasons, doesn't really tell us why. We could make a lot of conjecture. I think it's probably multifaceted dynamic because he's human, right? Like you and I, and when I do or don't want to do something, I'm probably a lot of reasons why I do or don't want to do things. Maybe 40 years of learning I was somebody and 40 years of learning I'm nobody kind of have something to do with why at this point I don't want to go, right? No, I don't want to do that. Thank you. I'm good. Kind of confused at this moment. <laughs> kind of not sure what's going on, but I don't want to go. So he's having this conversation with God and in verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go? And you know what? That's a good question for you and I to ask. Who am I? Who am I? If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, for you to ask that question is a very important question. Because you are a person who is lost. 
and you are a person who is loved, and you are a person who is desired by your creator, but you are a person who is honestly doomed without him. You have no current purpose and your trajectory, well, it's doomed. You need Jesus. You need to trust him. You need to receive his forgiveness. You need to understand that God did come into this world and put upon flesh. He took upon himself humanity. He lived a sinless life. He walked to that cross. He bore your sins. He rose from the dead and he is offering you forgiveness this morning. But if you've trusted Christ for your salvation, if you have done that, it's a good thing for you this morning to say, who am I? Who am I that I should go? I just want to take a second to remind you who you are. Who you are, Christian. Because you're the child of the Most High God. You're the child of the Most High God. You have been redeemed. Your sins have been taken away. He calls you righteous. He declares you holy. He has declared you forgiven. He has a future and a hope for you. He is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are cherished. You are his child. You are beloved, and nothing, nothing will change that. Do you understand that? If you have trusted Christ for your salvation, that is who you are. Don't forget it. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let him trick you. Don't forget that fact. That is who you are. Amen? Remember that. Remember that. The enemy tries to trip us up, tell us lies, Put us in situations where we forget that. But that is who you are. If you're in Christ, that is who you are. Moses says, who am I that I should go? And then the very next question kind of makes sense because God says to him, listen, listen, I will certainly be with you. Right? God says, I will be with you. Of course, we talked about this before. If Moses, I think, had really understood What that meant, maybe, although again, it's probably pretty dynamic of why he didn't want to go, but maybe he would have been like, oh, you're you're really going to go with me? Okay, let's go. But he's still definitely not like ready to go, right? And the next question he asks, okay then, who are you? First, who am I? Who am I to go? And his answer is, I'm going to go with you. Christian, everything that I just declared about who you are, that has everything to do with who he is. You understand that? That's the value of salvation. It's his salvation. He saved you. He saved you because he loved you. He is a good God. He did all the work. He died for your sins. It's his righteousness that God has covered you in. And everything I just said about the Bible declares about who you are in Christ, it's all valued in who he is. So the very next question, well, who are you? He says, says, let's keep reading. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, See, Moses isn't really unsure of what, you know, like who he's talking to, right? That's not really what's going on here. He, he understands that this is the one who had met with Abraham and told him to go. He understands that this is the one who had met with Isaac. He understands that this is the one who had made promises to Jacob. He understands that this is the one that they had been waiting for. He understands that this is the one that had, had, had written destiny on his life. He wants to know who he is. There's a difference there, right? He wants to know who he is here. He says, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and and they say to me, 
What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, fast forward a little bit, in, and I think it's verse 4 of chapter 6. Verse 3. Verse 3 of chapter 6, it says, this is God speaking. It says, I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. When, when Abraham here asks, or pardon me, <laughs> when Moses here asks, what's your name? God later tells him, hey, I appeared to them as God Almighty, but by my name they didn't know me. Guys, God's going to tell him his name. This is one of those areas of Scripture that people kind of get a little bit weirded out about. Well, let, let me just keep reading and I'll explain this in a second. Verse 14, he says, And God said to Moses, I am... I'm back on chapter 3, if you didn't follow me. I went back to chapter 3, verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moses, who am I? Who am I that I should go? God said, I'll be with you. The value of who you are is that I am with you. Right? So then he goes, well, who are you? Like, who, who, who should I say that's going with me then? And he says, I am is sending you. Right? And later on, he says, hey, by, by my name, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't know me. But guys, here's the thing. Genesis is filled with, with Yahweh, with Yahshua. They did know his name. They did actually have the name Yahshua or, or Yahweh. And by the way, there's a lot of information you can go look up in Yahweh, Yahshua, Jehovah, which one is it? You know, how do we pronounce it? Probably none of, none of these. We've taken Adonai and, and YWH, whatever it is, and we've put those together because they've taken out the vowels. And it's a confusing topic that I don't have all the notes here to explain it to you. So if you want to go look that up later, you can. Um, I'm not even here to make that argument of how to, how to say the name, right? My point here is this. Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that in Genesis, they were calling him by that name prior to him giving this to Moses. So what is God talking about? There's a difference in knowing someone's name and knowing who they are. When he says here, I am sends you. I am will be with you. It's the value of the statement. It's the understanding of, of who God is. And that is what Moses is asking. And that is what God is revealing. And that is the whole point of this. God is making himself known in a greater way than has ever been known prior to this moment in history. Maybe save some of what possibly Adam knew about God could be understood. We understand that throughout history, God, God's uh, revelation of himself is what we call progressive. That is, he has made himself known more throughout, throughout history. He, he, he has made more of himself known until we come to Jesus. The full revelation of, if you want to know who God is, you want to know who He is? Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus, the final and full revelation of the Father. If you have seen Me, Jesus says, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. You want to know who the Father is? Look at Jesus. And you will understand who the Father is. Abraham responded to what God had revealed to him about who He was. And he knew a name. And he knew some things. But Moses is getting an insight here. He says, I am. 
Listen, you can't say I am. Because as soon as you say I am, you were. You're moving through time. You never are I am. You always were. But God is I am. And listen, you can't say I am because the I am allows you to be. If he decides you are not, you isn't anymore. The I am is the only one that can say I am. He is self-existent. He is not dependent upon anyone else. You are wholly dependent upon I am. He didn't start somewhere. You started. When you were born, despite some religion's gobbledygook, that's where you started. That's when you began. And by the way, that happened at conception. That's when you began. I am. God is, God is speaking of his eternality. He's eternal. He is the only one who is outside of time. In a minute, he'll say, he'll say, listen, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Once you... Once you go to your brothers and you show them these things, you're going to go to the Pharaoh and you're going to say, let my people go three days in the journey so they can worship to me. But I am sure he will not let you go, even with a strong hand. Well, how does God know this? Because he is I am. He is I am. God is omniscient. He knows everything. Now, now, we just, every time we talk, within I am, I believe, and I probably won't be able to do this this morning because of I am not I am. So I don't have the ability to reason everything here and remember everything. <laughs> but the I am, in this I believe, you could probably reason out every one of his attributes within this statement. This is, a, this is a clear declaration of who God is, not just his name. He is telling Moses who he is. I'm going with you. And he's making himself known. And later on we'll even see, it's really cool because the Pharaoh goes, who is the Lord? I don't know him. I don't know who this is. And then later, like as we progress, Moses continually says, so that you may know who the Lord is. Right? God, can, God is revealing himself through all of this. There's, a, there's a, like a revelation of, of who God is. He's revealing himself to Israel. Remember we said that this is a book of faith as God makes himself known. And hasn't that exactly the same thing happened to to you as Jesus has made himself known to you, the purpose, the plan, the goal is to do what? What in your life? What is God's goal in your life as he makes himself known to you, as Christ becomes known to you? Why do you read the word of God? Why are you reading it? Why do you go to the gospels? Why do you try to get to know Jesus more? What's the purpose? Faith. To put your trust in him. To believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To trust that he is with you. To trust that he knows you. Why does it matter? We talk about who you are. Who you are is valued in who he is. If you don't know and believe who he is, then it doesn't even matter. It's all faith. God is trying to build faith in them. So he says, I am. I am that I am. God is omniscient. He knows it all together. He's not learning anything. He knows it all together. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere, all at the same time. I am. I'm there. I don't get there. He doesn't show up. He doesn't, well, I hope God shows up. Have you ever kind of said that in a, you know, kind of just like, I hope, I hope God shows up. He doesn't show up. 
He is there. He doesn't need to show up. You, you showed up. He was already there. It doesn't work that way. He's omnipotent. There's no end to his power. There's no end to it. There's no limit to it. I am. He's immutable. It's one of those words that doesn't mean anything to most of us, right? Like, oh, he's immutable. Great. I mean, it just means he doesn't change. He never changes. God never changes. I am. Let, again, as soon as you say I am, you were. You, you, you can't say that. Only God can say that. I am has sent me to you. God is revealing himself. This is, this is, how, this is who God is. This, is. this is the God we serve. Isn't it wonderful to know that God wants to make himself known to you? And do you realize that? Do you understand that? That God wants you to know him. He, he actually, that's the whole, we don't, we're not practicing a religion. Religious activity in the, for the purpose of serving Christ is not wrong. It's called piety. It's actually something that's good as a Christian, and, and that's fine. Unless, unless you're doing it to save yourself or keep yourself saved, right? Which is not fine. But we don't really practice a religion, so to speak. Our purpose is relationship. You understand that? The, the purpose, when I go to the word of God, when I come to this book, what am I doing? I want to know the I am. I want to know who, I want to know who it is that's going with me. I want to know who he is. I want to understand him. You know, when I go through Romans and I read some of the great scriptures, some of those wonderful passages, Romans is just filled with it. And I know that all things are working out for the good of those who know Him and love Him and are called according to His purposes. If I read that Scripture, oh, it's so great that's in the Bible. Well, it, it's only great that's in the Bible because of the I am that's behind the statement. Right? It's because of who said it. It's because of Him who is able to do it. Oh, that's so great. Moreover, Moses said to him, verse 15, Moreover, God, Moses, no, I got that wrong. Did any of you catch that? You were going to let me roll. Moreover, 15, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. You know, as I read this, I thought this was really interesting. Just, just this thought came to my mind. God could have shown up in a dream to every single one of the Israelites and been like, hey, listen, I met with Moses, he's coming. He is the guy I chose for this job, so just receive him, right? But he didn't do that. That's not how God chose to do it. God met with Moses, and he sent Moses to them, and then they needed to believe Moses. You go, well, why did God do that that way? I mean, we could come up with a lot of reasons, but he did it that way because he's God, and he does it, does it the way he wants to do it. And you don't get to choose how God does it. But all I know is this, that how God did it, every single choice God made and everything that God did throughout all of the scriptures led to this thing. You and I have trusted Christ for our salvation. We are here today because of everything that God has done throughout history. Every, every way that God has done it has led to everything that has followed. You, you understand what I'm saying? And God here chose to meet with Moses and send him to the people. And he's, and he's building faith in the people. Verse 16, go 
and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the land of, uh, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then they will heed your voice and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel to the land of Egypt, and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us and now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. See, God knows exactly what's coming down. And you notice who's not going to let them go. But I am sure who's not going to let them go. Who's not going to let him go? The king of Egypt will not let him go. It's a decision he's making. Pay attention to that. Not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go, that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely of her, of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And, and, and when we get there, you'll read this. We'll see this. They will literally go to their neighbors the night of the Passover. And they will say, hey, do you want to give us some of your jewelry? And do you want to give us some of your gold? And, and the Egyptians will be like, yeah, here you go. Get out of here. Here you go. Take my stuff. And it's almost like God is giving them back pay for all the years of servitude. And they don't got to steal it. They don't have to go to war for it. God just pays them. Just, just here you go. Take, they're going to plunder them on the way out. It is crazy how God works. You know? You ever think like, I got to fight to get, you know, to, to get my back paid and make sure I'm taken care of. No, you don't. You let God take care of it. God takes care of it here. God take care of it there. Does that mean that you're definitely going to get your back pay? No, that doesn't mean that. Nope, he didn't promise that. But God will take care of it. That's all that means. You just need to leave it in the hands of the Lord and let him take care of it. Get what I'm saying? Chapter 4. You didn't think we would possibly get to chapter 4 this morning. Some of you were so doubting, so doubting. You walked in here going, no way, you were so doubters. So doubting me. And you had good reason. We were in chapter 3 for what, like six weeks? So I forgive you. All right, chapter 4. Then Moses answered and said, Now, if you think Moses is not trying to get out of this, you're not reading the same thing I'm reading. And I don't know how you came to that conclusion, but it seems to me he is clearly trying to get out of this. God literally just told him, then they will, verse 18 of chapter 3, then they will heed your voice. He told him, go and tell them this, that I am has sent you, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, that I have seen this, this uh, what's going on here, and I've sent you to, you know, Moses to me, I've sent you, and you're going to do this, and they will heed your voice. My question for you is, do you think that if Moses would have accepted that answer, that they would have heeded his voice? I personally would say yes. Now, we, 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 that's conjecture, because that's not what happened. So that is conjecture. But God said that's what would have happened. So I'm going to accept God's words that God said that's what would have happened. They will heed your voice. Moses doesn't believe God at this point. That's what I'm reading on the pages. If you agree with me or not, 
That's, what, that's how I'm taking this. That's what it seems to be saying. He says, then Moses answered, said, but suppose, I'm still not sure I'm with you on this, but suppose they will not believe me. I know you said they will, okay? I know you said that, but now here's, here's a good reminder. You seem to think, I'm getting in your head now. You seem to think that for God to use you, you've got to have your faith dialed in to level 10 sometimes, don't you? Well, no, I've got to be ramped up and ready to go, all dialed up and faith ready and believe in God for every minute of this thing. Moses wasn't. There is, no, there is no point in this where I'm reading this and going, Moses was just rocking it, believe in God for every second of this. He is asking a lot of questions. He is not believing. If he was really dialed up on 10, he would have been like, oh, they're going to believe? Let's do this. Let's go. You're with me? They're going to they're gonna accept that? Let's go. But that's not what we're reading. My point is, you can go knees shaken, not so sure God's got this, and God can use you. Because the value of who you are and the value of what God is going to do is all resting on God, not you. You understand that? That is so awesome. That is so powerful. That is so perfect. That is exactly where we should be. Our faith, our strength. We read this Saturday morning. Saturday morning, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He says, be strong in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. Our strength is not found in us. It's found in grace. And that grace is in Jesus Christ. We go in that strength. We don't go in our strength. We don't go in us. We go in Him. Right? And a lot of times we're going terrified, unsure, and slightly unwilling. Have you been there? If you are not nodding, you, you have. Have you been there? Have you been unsure, slightly, you know, l- a lack of faith, and slightly unwilling, but you went anyways. You're like, okay, I'm not really sure how this is going to work out, but I will go, maybe. And God just blew the doors off things, right? Maybe not Egypt style, like, you know, Maybe not this. I hope, like, I hope not this. We read this in the news. Some town got firebombed and you were there. Anyways, okay. I'll move on. Where was I? Suppose, verse 1 of chapter 4. Now you're thinking I'll never get through chapter 4. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And, and the reason why I brought all this up, I want you to understand something. The miraculous signs are for Moses. They're not, they're not for, they're, they're, these are for Moses. And, and I kind of, that was an aha moment for me. Maybe you were already there. You probably were. I'm slow. But the, this is the first time I read, it's like, oh, these were all for Moses. These weren't for the people. These were for Moses. And that kind of really spoke to me. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses was literally afraid of it and fled from it. Like he literally ran from it. Ah! Wonder what kind of serpent it was. He's running around the desert for 40 years. You think he never saw a serpent before? Was it a really big serpent? Or was it just the fact that his... Rod became a serpent that scared him. Like, either way, it freaked him out. He fled from it, right? I would too. I'm not judging him. All of you would too. Maybe a couple of you wouldn't, but most of you would. We would all run from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand. Now he's like, really? And take it by the tail, seriously. And he reached out his hand, he caught it up, and it became a rod in his hand again that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, uh, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, put your hand in your bosom. 
And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom and he drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. And it shall be, if they do not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on dry land, the water which you take from the river will become blood on dry land. Okay, I'm not going to have time to hit everything I want to hit here. So we're just going to camp here in these verses, but I do want to show you something. You come to the end of this, this chapter. The very end of the chapter, verse 31. Moses meets with the people. He does all these signs. Read verse 31. So the people believed, uh, and when they heard, they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked on their affliction, and they bowed their heads and they worshiped. One verse. One verse. The people believed. One verse for the people. All this stuff for Moses. I don't know. Kind of just telling to me. They're like, okay, we're good. Let's do this. Now, granted, the people have a lot of problems later. So they're not off the hook as far as like super faithful, like believing people. Like they all die in the wilderness. So they're kind of a messed up people. But, but when it comes to this event, one verse. Anyways, I digress. So there's three miracles here. And I just thought this really interesting. So we're going to close with this long closing you can look at these in two different ways, these, these, three, these three miracles. And uh, take whichever one away with you that helps you. <laughs> maybe, maybe both of them. Overlay them. So one, you're looking at it from a prophetic sense. Like, you know, because everything here, right, speaks of Christ. The whole scriptures speak of Christ. Right? Jesus says, you search the scriptures, but it's they that speak of me. As a matter of fact, I skipped it, but you go to the I am. Jesus is I am. Right? What is it? John. I mean, you could look it up later, but I wrote it down. John 8.58. Jesus literally says, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, Jesus did declare himself God very clearly there. They picked up, picked up stones to stone him, you know. Um, so Jesus is everywhere through this story. But this is pretty cool. Because there are three different things that these... The, or something that these three different uh, uh, miracles could represent. The staff. The staff. He says, throw that thing down, and what does it turn into? A serpent. God telling Moses, Yahweh's got power over sin, over Satan. I got power over that. Pick it back up, turns into a rod. Well, over Satan, right? Over, the, over death. Put, put your hand into your, into your bosom, pull it out, turns leprous, put it back in, uh, goes back. What is, what is leprosy a sign of in the Old Testament? Anyone? Sin. Yahweh's got power over sin, right? And, and, then, and then the blood or the water turned into blood, and he's going to cleanse us of it through blood, right? Through the washing of blood. And so I think there's kind of a foreshadowing of sin, the power of Satan, the, the, the power of sin being cleansed by the washing of blood uh, in these miracles here. I think that's pretty clear. I think that's pretty obvious, right? And I think it's a foreshadowing that we could definitely see in this. But, but these things, I think, also speak very specifically to Moses. And I think that they can speak very specifically to us. Because there are times where God is going to call you to go. He's going to call you to go and... and you're going to rightfully say, who am I? You know, who am I to go? Who am I to go? And maybe there are things that are, that are holding you back. And he says to Moses, Moses has got the staff in his hand. Now, if you know anything about shepherding, and I myself am an expert at shepherding. Now, I've never shepherded a day in my life. I've done a smidge of reading about shepherding, right? We all have probably done a little bit of reading or we've had some pastor who told you a little bit about shepherding or something. 
There's some good books, you know. Um, Sheeps and shepherding tend to come up a lot in studying the scriptures for good reasons. But the staff of a shepherd tends to be, from my understanding, their primary tool with shepherding. Is that something you've heard and understood? And it's something that I've heard and understood, right? Thy rod and thy shaft, it protects me. It, it's, a, it's a comfort. It has a hook, you know, so they can pull them out of things and they would whack them with it or they would do different things with it. They would protect it, you know, from animals with it. I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of the thing, you know? Like if I'm a shepherd, I've got this, this rod, this staff, and I use this staff all the time in my profession. What does he say to do with it? Throw it on the ground. What does it become? A serpent. Hey, Moses. That job, that profession, that worldly thing, that's going to hold you back. Don't, don't hold on to that. Don't hold on to that thing. That thing's going to keep you back. Well, pastor, are you saying I should quit my job and just... Go on the corner with a sign? Probably not. No, I'm, prob I'm probably not saying that to you. If that's what you're getting, I'm probably not saying that to you. But are you entangled in it? Another thing we got on Saturday morning. Do you, you know, a good soldier for Christ is not entangled in the affairs of this world. There's a difference between being a good provider and being entangled. There's a difference. Are you... Are you so wrapped up in your job that you're not living for Christ? Are you, are you serving your job or are you serving Christ? Now, you need to work. Listen, we live in a fallen world. We're, we're part of this cursed world, and you're going to have to work. And sometimes that work is going to require you to do things you don't want to do, like work on a Sunday. I get it. I get it. Don't, don't be condemned for that. That's going to happen sometimes. That's not what this is about. That's not what this is about at all. You need to talk to Jesus about how that works out in your life. That's not my job this morning at all. That's not what I'm doing at all. So don't hear that. And it's not just the job. It's anything worldly. It's anything in this life that is keeping you from going in whatever way that means in your Christian life. It doesn't necessarily mean the mission field. We always hear go, we're like, yeah, Africa. Yeah, that's maybe, probably not. How many of us could really go to Africa, right? If we all went to Africa, then there would be none of us back here to send money to all of us that went to Africa. No, but seriously, right? But, but maybe it's just go talk to that one person that's sitting over there that needs to hear about Jesus from you, right? Maybe that's just the go that you need to do. But you have a deadline to meet, and so you can't. But you don't trust God to help you meet that deadline? You get what I'm saying? Like, it could just be those simple, not entangled. Happens to me all the time. You go, but you're a pastor. Yeah, but I have deadlines. It's called Sunday. You, you, you realize every Sunday I've got a deadline. And there are times I look at my boys, and I think pretty soon they're going to be graduating and doing all this, and sometimes I've got to go close the book, go hang out with the boys. So we all have our struggles for this, guys. It isn't just you, it's every one of us. Throw it down. Recognize it'll turn into a snake if you let it. But God's got power over it. Pick it up by the tail, it turns back into a staff. Just give it to Jesus. Whatever it is. It could be, it could be so many things. It could just be so many things. You talk to Jesus about it, you ask him what it is, and then you just give it to him. I mean, it's really just that simple. Whatever it is, just go, Lord, you can have this. It doesn't mean quit the job. It just means give it to Jesus and let him be Lord over it. So he tells you, you know, you don't need to work overtime this week. The next three, yes, but not this one. Be with the fam. You get what I'm saying? Give it to Jesus and let him be Lord over it. And then the leprosy thing, right? He's Lord over your body, guys. I, I'm, I worked in the health and fitness industry for 19 years. Oh my word, is that a messed up industry. It's all about making you feel scared that you're going to die. Right? Like, I mean, really. And health is a good thing. I'm all about keeping the machine healthy. Like, I think that's a good call. 
right? It's a good call for my wife. It's a good call for my family. Like I want to be around and I don't want to, I want to be around and I want to be able to actually do something later. So I think that's a good idea. But you can get too wrapped up in that. It's like you're living for the tent. You should be living for the mansion. This is a tent. You're living in the tent right now. It's temporal. It's temporary. Do your best to, to patch it as you need, right? And, and, and maybe take care of it the best you can. But don't live for the tent. Live for the mansion. The mansion is coming next. That's in the next life. Find a balance there. Exercise is good. Don't live to exercise. Eating right is good. Don't live to do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? God is Lord over that. I don't know that you could ask him to bless a Twinkie. Okay, I, I, maybe don't eat the Twinkie. Right, but you don't only have to eat nuts either. Actually, if you did that, that'd be horrible on your colon. Like, don't do that. It would be. It's true. And the blood and the water. Finished, man. It's finished. It is finished. Christ has washed. If you are in Jesus, you've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been cleansed. He's, he's Lord over your life, your sin, your future. You've been, you've been forgiven. Live like it. Breathe in that air of forgiveness. Live in that place. Rejoice in that place. Christian, we, we have so much to live, so much to, to be joyful for. People should look at our lives and wonder what is wrong with us in a good way. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like, not like, what's wrong with you? But like, why are you so different, man? Like, I see your life is not necessarily better than mine. You know, you're going through it. People in your life are getting sick. You got problems, you got challenges, but something's different. And you can't manufacture that. Like, you, you know, like we try to do that sometimes because pastors tell you what I'm telling you and then you're gonna go and you're gonna be like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out and I'm gonna be like joyful. No, 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 no wrong focus, focus on Jesus. So here's the thing, here's the answer. The answer isn't go out and do what I just told you to do and be joyful, put your, Put your, all your focus on Christ and the finished work of the cross, and He will, will bring the fruit of that in your life. Right? That, that's the answer. That's how it actually works. That's how it actually works. Know who He is. Know that the value of who you are is in who He is. And just go and enjoy that. Amen? We did pretty good this morning. Man, we made some progress. I'm not going to say I'm proud because that would be bad, but kind of proud of it, I guess. Let's pray.